Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here um, and talk to you this evening. I'm going to, um, uh, as we heard, I, I devoted the, uh, my research in the last few years to understand how emotions affect decision making. Okay? Um, in a variety of um, areas in economics, uh, mostly uh, in interactions, and, and much of what I, I write has bearing to um, HR, human resources issues, and, and the workplace. Uh, but some of what I'm looking at um, has to do, and this is what I want to uh, discuss with you today, um, financial decisions. And I want to um, talk with you a little bit about basically about the conventional wisdom which is wrong. And the conventional wisdom which is wrong is that most of our wrong decision making, departures from rationality in financial decision making are caused because complexity. This is the conventional wisdom. We are not smart enough to understand um, the uh, financial market and, and, and uh, uh, even, even, even if we are have been educated to do this, but definitely not the, um, what we call um, the, uh, the small investor. And uh, we, tend to be we tend to do mistakes because, because of the complexity involving financial decision making. And, and uh, most of the literature that um, addresses this issue try to um, give us some hints and, and, um, and tricks about how to make things simpler for us. Uh, cognitively, but what I'm going to argue to you is that we are looking at the wrong place. And in fact, most of our uh, departures from rational decision making is not caused because things are too complex for us, it's caused because emotions, okay? So what I'll do, I'll start by um, discussing the market and the way wrong decision making affect the market um, and then I'll go more, more concretely to um, how we, investors, and when I say investors, I might surprise you. We, we uh, I mean, you, professional investors, um, uh, don't hate me for saying it, to a large extent, uh, are not very different than what we call the, uh, the simple investor, the, the uneducated investor. To, um, but, but we have, but you have, uh, much more tools to, uh, to improve your decision making, taking into account the, um, the fallacies that I'm, I'm going to introduce to you. When we talk about decision making and rationality, rationality has two faces. Rational behavior uh, involves two components. One we call beliefs and the other are actions. Rational, be rational behavior and when we make decisions, uh, including financial decision, we first have to form beliefs correctly, okay? That's the first stage. And the second stage is we have to optimize our actions based on the belief that we have formed to ourselves. And when I talk about emotional barriers to decision making, I'm including both the level of beliefs as well as the level of actions. And I'm, I'm, we're going to, to see it, okay? Human biases and deviation it, uh, occur in, in, in both uh, branches of rational decision making. Okay? And as I said, um, we, we, can, we can find, and there, there are uh, uh, quite a bit of research by now um, ab about how people make decisions uh, that, that includes both professional investors and small investors. And we, 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 uh, we will argue, I will argue, that uh, some of these barriers um, are not, uh, it's not that only the small investors are prone to, to be affected by them, but, but basically everybody that deals with uh, financial decision making. Okay? Most of the biases, as I said, are caused not because our cognitions, some of them because our cognitions are, are, we have limitations, cognitive limitations, but most of them are due to emotions. Okay. Um, hence, even if we are cognitively aware of the biases, uh, it might be hard to avoid them. 
And, and um, this, this aspect of the difference between emotions and cognitions and the fact that we have to pay more attention also to our um, emotional uh, effects on decision making suggests that the remedies uh, for avoiding uh, wrong behavior or, or, or wrong decisions in financial investments, um, the remedies are, should be quite different than the ones that uh, uh, usually are being proposed. Okay? And, 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 and the, the remedies that are usually being proposed are all linked to something that has to do with cognition, rarely to emotions. Okay? So these are the two branches that I mentioned. Uh, on the right hand, I, I talk about beliefs, and on the left hand, these are actions. And in both branches, there are some limitations that are due to cognition, and some uh, that are uh, born by emotions. Okay? And one I can already um, uh, say the punchline about emotions, one, one of the most critical emotions that affect our decision-making in financial matters is regret. And I'll, be, I'll, I'll elaborate on this later. So let's start with limited arbitrage. Let's start with the market. We might think, um, want to, the basic question is, how does the market react to irrationality? Right? Okay, we might think that you know, if, uh, if, if um, even a fraction of individuals that make financial decisions is, 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 is able to avoid these barriers and make correct decision making, um, it might not have any effect on the market because, um, because the market will, will get into the right equilibrium uh, through these people who are perfectly rational, um, exploiting the market or taking the advantages of these, uh, uh, these op market opportunities that others miss, okay? Okay, so the question is, can, small, can a small group of rational players um, correct the market by means of arbitrage? And this is what we used to think as economists 20, 30 years ago, but now we, we understand that this is not the case, okay? Exploiting arbitrage is a difficult matter. Um, searching for arbitrage opportunities is costly. We know that. And, and it in itself complicated. Arbitrage required hedging. Very often it's impossible to find the right stock that will do the perfect hedging. Okay? So in, 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 in contrast, <coughs> to what Milton Friedman, for example, was thinking, was trying to preach um, several decades ago um, about the fact that irrational behavior is not, is not really um, an impediment for, um, for market efficiency. Today we know that this is not the case. Okay? We have some more evidence today about arbitrage, for instance, um, uh, Stock enters the index NASDAQ. Uh, when it enters, the same day when it enters the index NASDAQ, it, it's, its value is appreciated by 3.5% on average in the same trading day. And much of this increase survives in the long run. Okay, you would have thought that um, um, uh, using arbitrage, this these gap would have been closed, but, but, but it's just so just that some are arbitrage opportunities are, um, are left there and, and are not being exploited. So, so irrational behavior does affect the market, even when we have um, a small core of super rational investors that are, uh, that are operating in the market. Okay? So now I want to talk about uh, limited rationality at the level of belief. So basically what I'm going to tell you is a series of findings that we uh, behavioral economists have been uh, um, finding um, in the last several decades about the way people perceive probabilities or uncertainty. Beliefs has to do with uncertainty. Okay, we we form beliefs on things that we don't we, we, on which we don't have certainty. When we have certainty, we not we don't need beliefs. Okay. So one, one um, 
one real problem is the uh, incorrect internalization of information, okay? Misreading facts, okay? Then I'm gonna talk about uh, weak probabilistic intuition. Okay, here is an example, anchoring, okay? We tend to form our beliefs about events based on sometimes irrelevant information that is streaming towards us. Here is an experiment that has been done several decades ago. You ask uh, people, um, how many African countries have a UN, UN membership? Okay? Something that most of us would not know, could guess, could make a guess, could make an intelligent guess or less intelligent guess, but we, most of us would not know the answer. Now, subject, we're asked this question, we're, for, we're primed by two different preliminary questions, and um, quite stunningly, these preliminary questions affected the way they answered the first questions. So the first group got the question, is the numbers of African UN member states more or less than 15? Okay, this was one group. And then there was another group that was asked the same questions, but with the end staying um, more or less than 100, okay? And what has been found is that um, people who got uh, the first questions estimated the number of countries who have a UN membership to be much smaller, significantly smaller than those who got the second question, okay? So this priming um, that, uh, that uh, uh, came before the question, actually pushed people to um, distorted their beliefs, their original belief that they might have had. Okay? This, this, this shows how, how belief can very easily manipulate it, and, 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 um, and um, we, are, we are all prone to this type of manipulation. Second thing is that um, probabilities are affected, are biased, um, by time and place, okay? We're giving more weight to events that are recent in time and close in place, okay? We assign a higher probability to things that seem to be salient, okay? I, um, one of the articles that I wrote uh, a, a couple of weeks ago uh, was in the Los Angeles Times, and I, and I discussed, it was under the title, How Not to Treat Anxiety. And the question I raised is, is well, I mentioned that the terror, the whole thing about, the whole story about the terror is being completely exaggerated in the, in the Western world. The, the risk, the individual risk of being affected by, by a terror attack is, is natural, is really natural. Uh, and there are so many things that uh, involve way more risk that we pay much less attention to. I gave an example, I'm coming from Israel, and you might have heard about the Intifada that, that took place between 2002, or 2000 to 2004. Um, um, and I look at statistics, and, and in each of these years, Indeed, many people died from terrorist attacks, but in each of these years, more people died uh, in a city like New Orleans alone from, from violence than in the entire state of Israel, okay? Uh, many of my friends, uh, academic friends, didn't dare even to think about coming to Israel. Uh, none of them would have thought for, for a minute to, to cancel um, a flight to New Orleans or Washington. I give the other example was Washington. And the reason why we tend to be so frightened by, by terrorist attack is that um, they're extremely salient. And one, one, one reason that they're salient is that we tend to talk about it more than we should. And it's one of the things that um, that uh, is one of the risks, terror is one of the risks which, which, which is endogenous to the way we treat it. Unlike other risks, for instance, diseases, right? Terror will become more frequent the more we talk about it. 
Okay? And, um, and the purpose of terror is to um, make people afraid. And we tend to be afraid by exaggerating the probability of being affected by terrorism. And the way uh, we exaggerate this probability, and the reason why we exagger exaggerate this probability is simply because uh, these events are salient. Uh, people talk about it too much. There is stiffness about belief. Stiffness is one of the problems in forming beliefs. After we endowed with a set of belief, it's going to be hard for us to change them. Well, we, we often say we don't let the facts confuse us, but it's really true. It's, it becomes very hard for us to change uh, the way we think or change our set of beliefs. We tend, there, there are different ways we are uh, distorting um, our, our beliefs or, or um, make it hard, harder for us to calibrate our belief with the truth. Um, one of them is uh, showing aversion uh, against seeking more evidence. Once we have this set of beliefs, we say, that's enough. Don't, don't, don't give me more evidence. I, I think I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure about what to do. Okay? We tend to underestimate the new evidence that speak against our initial beliefs. Okay? But there's even more pathological phenomenon in which we often tend to interpret wrongly the new evidence that derived to us, regarding it as a support to our view instead of uh, evidence against our view. Okay, I'm, I'm lack of time to give you examples in this direction, but there are lots of examples in which it, it occurs. Hmm? Okay? And this stiffness applies not only to ideology, and we see it very often when we see uh, um, political debates between parties, between um, fractions, ideology. But I, I'm, I'm coming from, from the academia, and I'm doing science, and I can tell you that the same phenomena applies there. Okay? Stiffness in beliefs in academia is very often. It's, it's one of our... Um, most severe um, impediments for making progress. But it's also something that you should think about. It's also something that I believe uh, applies to your territory. Management, financial strategies, people tend to have, um, um, to have uh, serious stiffness in changing their minds. There's a, there's a nice joke I, I heard uh, from a friend about Warren Buffett, we all know is an excellent um, investor. And, um, and the story tells that he was driving on Highway 1 um, at some night. And while he's driving, his wife is calling him in the cellular phone. And she says, Warren Buffett, where are you? He says, I'm, 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 I'm coming home. I see. Uh, you must be on, on Highway 1. She says, he says, yes, yes, I'm on Highway 1. But be very careful. They just announced that there's some nut who is driving in the wrong direction. So Warren Buffett says, one nut? I see hundreds of them. <laughs> okay. So this is, a, this, is, this is a stiffness of beliefs. It's a very, very extreme one. Now I want to move to bounded rationality at the level of actions. And here, in this territory, almost all causes are emotional. Not cognitive, but emotional. And this is why it's harder to deal with them. Okay? One, of the, one of the most uh, prominent examples of, of uh, emotional bias is the fact that we treat differently losses and gains. This is something that has been discovered by um, uh, my colleague at the Center for the Study of Rationality. Um, and, uh, uh, and other people. Um, Kahneman, uh, and first he wrote about it, Kahneman is my colleague uh, at, the, at the Rationality Center, and other people, uh, he start, they started it, but other people built on it uh, quite heavily. Uh, we have a very strange arithmetic for gains and losses, for good things and bad things um, happening to us. I'm calling it the arithmetic of emotions in my book. 
um, um, which means that gaining something gives us less pleasure than an equivalent loss. Okay? An investment that made us a lot to lose 1,000 1, euro today and win 1,000 tomorrow will make us worse off. Eventually, the experience, the mental experience, will be negative. Why? Because gains loom less. Losses looms greater than gains. The disutility that we experience from losing 1,000 euro is greater than the joy that we experience from gaining the same amount of money. Okay? Our mental accounting, this is one thing. Our mental accounting responds to uh, uh, percentage more than absolute value, okay? Uh, this, is, this might be in the borderline between cognition and emotion, but it's something that, that, that is really, I think is really important. When you, um, if, you if you asked uh, to um, spend a little bit extra effort to buy your next card somewhere else um, and save 1% of the cost of the car, You tend to say, one, well, we are for 1%, I'm not going to take this extra effort, okay? But if somebody tells you um, um, that your next dinner, birthday dinner with your wife, can save you 50% on the dinner, if you ex expand exactly the same effort, then you might do it. And you are likely to do it, in spite of the fact that in, in, in Euro terms, Doing the first thing would, would be much more reasonable than the second thing. You would save yourself much more money uh, in the first case than in the second case. No, but we, we, are, we are geared to think about uh, both profits and losses in terms of percentages rather than in terms of absolute values. This difference between loss and gains also affect our um, risk postulate, the way we, we, we experience risk. Because what it says is that, um, um, well, we all know that we are um, risk averse when it gets to, to investments. Um, turns out that the, the fact that we treat losses and gains differently also imply that we are risk lovers in terms of um, losses. And uh, although it's hard to uh, prove it uh, experimentally or, or with data, the people uh, claim that it extends not only to money, but also to other things that happen to us in life. So if you want to try to see whether it's true or not for you, uh, uh, let's look at these two options. Most people would prefer um, a sure payment of seven uh, 7,500 euro over a lottery that pays 5,000 euro or 10,000 with equal probability, the expected payoff would be the same in, in the two cases. But people, because of risk aversion, uh, would prefer the sure thing over the lottery. But now let's take this other example that concerns not rewards, but rather um, bad things happening to us, losses, okay? What would you prefer, three years in prison or a lottery that assigns you either two or four years in prison with equal probability? Okay? Allow you to speculate on the way you would answer these questions, but I, I believe most people would say that they'd prefer the lottery. Okay? Okay? Um, Now come regret, and regret has uh, potentially affect our decision in a variety of, um, of ways. By the way, all these, um, all these biases that I mentioned, now there is um, a lot of interest by government to utilize these biases and, and sort of use them as nudges to affect decision-making in a variety of, of fields in, um, uh, in the public um, 
sphere. Um, the, the leading country in this approach is, is the United Kingdom that has a group in the, of, in the um, cabinet office called the uh, Behavioral Insight Team that uh, uses some, th some of these biases, for instance, to uh, get people um, report their tax forms more honestly than, than, than they would have done without these, without these tricks or, or um, nudging, nudging, um, nudging people who get fines to pay them on time nudging people to um, behave more responsibly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the environment. These are all noble causes, and we try not to, uh, not to get into territories which we think that uh, our nudges might be effective, but uh, uh, effective for the wrong reason. And uh, there are other government um, uh, that are, uh, that are uh, initiating it, um, France, uh, Australia, and I'm leading a team in, in Israel. Um, we're, we're trying to um, exchange data and experiences in, um, in uh, uh, the way we, um, the data that we collect. And hopefully, um, hopefully uh, this will make a substantial change in the way um, public, um, public life is being, um, is being run in many of these countries and hopefully also in, uh, in Switzerland here. Okay? Let me talk a little bit about regret. Regret is evolutionary mechanism for learning. Without it, we cannot enter... Uh, in uh, internalize mistakes, right? Um, regretting decision is extremely important. One of the reasons uh, that we have emotions is that rational analysis is not, uh, is not effective enough to affect our memory. Okay? If you try to think about it, you, um, you, you must have met somebody, um, try to remember coming, going through somebody that you, you were sure you've seen before, okay? But you couldn't tell where or almost anything about this person, okay? You couldn't recall his or her name, you couldn't recall her profession or, or what you were talking about. Um, all, these, all this information was processed cognitively at the time you were seeing the person. But one thing you definitely remember is the entire experience, whether the experience was positive or negative. Whether the person seemed to be a nice guy or an arrogant. Okay? These this bits of information have an emotional effect on us. And why, that, this is why they're stored much more if effectively in our brain. And, and whenever we pull them, we can, we can make a lot of use of, of, of these, of these um, memories. This is why regret uh, is remembered much better than the, the rationalizing or analyzing the wrong decision that you have made. Okay, if, if without regret, if, if the only way n for us not to repeat mistakes was just remembering that the end of it was, was bad, without any, any, any emotional reaction, this would have not been effective for us to avoid the next mistake. Regret allow us to internalize these mistakes much more effectively and, and, and through it avoid the next mistake that has to do with the first one, that, that has some link with the first one. Unfortunately, this emotional reaction has also a negative side of it. First of all, we are processing regret in a very peculiar way, in a very non-symmetric way. Um, for instance, regret due to an action that caused us loss is greater than a regret when a similar loss is due to failing to act, right? I.e., we remain, when we remain in the status quo, 
we experience less regret, okay? Whenever we avoid doing something, it's less painful when, it re it, when, when we realize that we made a, made a mistake compared with the situation in which we, um, uh, we, took in, we took an action, we took a deliberate action because we thought that that's, what, that's the right action to do, and it ended up to be a wrong decision. That's when it, it's going to be much more painful for us, and regret is going to be much, much greater. Okay? Regret from, a sh from mistakes shared by many individuals is less severe relative to being the only person who made the mistake. We call it misery likes company. And this bias actually has an enormous influence on, on the way uh, we make financial decisions. I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on it. Another thing is the regret is the more salient and the more concrete a decision was avoiding it and realizing that the avoidance was wrong causes more regret. If the option was not so salient, if, if it wasn't, um, it was, you weren't at the stage where you really thought of taking this action, it wouldn't hurt as much as it would when you really thought about it and nevertheless didn't do it. My father, I remember my father who died several years ago, would cap kept telling us again and again, was obsessed about this real estate opportunity that he missed um, when he was young. Okay, he was, um, when he was about 30, he, he managed to take some mortgage, um, and there were two options. Uh, one, uh, buying an old house on a piece of land in the center of Jerusalem. Um, uh, which needed, obviously, a, a, an enormous renovation. And for the same price, you could buy an apartment, a tiny apartment in an uh, apartment building. Okay? Um, and uh, he claims, he blames his wife, of course, but eventually he bought the apartment. Hmm? And he couldn't, he couldn't get these things out of his mind for his entire life. And it wouldn't have been... It wouldn't have been the same if um, they really deliberated it and, and thought and, and sort of discussed the pros and the cons of each of these options and eventually um, decided for one of them, right? Uh, it's, it's that they thought about it, they deliberated it, and eventually made a decision that made it so painful for him to realize 20 years later uh, that the decision was wrong. Here is one. Here, here are some of the um, um, outcomes of regret, and not only regret. I'm going to say also the fear of regret. Okay. Um, well, this I mentioned. I want to talk about the fear of regret um, because we experience regret, um, and regret is, is an emotion that we, we, we don't like. Obviously, it's a, it's a negative emotion. We, 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 we prefer to skip it. And sometimes the only way to skip it is to take an action, to take a decision that you expect won't raise regrets in the future, just because of the fear of regret. Okay? The issue of sunk cost, the sunk cost paradox, is precisely this. What is a sunk cost paradox? You start a project. You uh, invested potentially some money, but, but more than that, you, you invested time and effort into this project. And gradually you notice that this was a wrong decision. You shouldn't have gotten into it in the first place. So you now have an option. You walk out of it, or you keep on walking. If you walk out of it, that's the point where you will feel regret, because you would admit that the, first, the decision in the first place was wrong. How do you avoid regret? You just keep on. Maybe, 
maybe things will change. Maybe with a very tiny probability, things will change. Okay? Moving on is a way, and often moving on would be a very, very wrong decision. But moving on would be a way for us to avoid, um, to avoid regret. Okay? You say, I sunk so much cost into it, what? I'm, I'm going to give it up now? No. Of course, it's irrelevant how much, how much cost you sunk into it. At the time when you have to make a decision, the past is irrelevant anymore. It is for our emotions. It's not, for, it's not relevant for, for, um, for rationality. Okay? Status quo bias. Why is it so hard to move people from one pension scheme to another? One of the things I'm working with the government in Israel is, is make people behave more responsibly with their pension schemes. Okay? And what we see is it's, it's very hard to, to, to get people enrolled to a different pension scheme, to a different, um, even to a different bank, to a different saving program. And, and we used to think that it's because uh, it's complicated, it's too complicated for them. But no, that's not the reason. The reason is that they like to get stuck in their status quo. They have a status quo bias. The reason why they have a status quo bias is because one of the biases in the way we process regret. Okay? If we stick with the status quo and it turns out to be wrong, we'll feel less regret than we than, than the case where we deliberately make a decision to change something, and by changing we make a wrong decision. Okay? When we opt out from the status quo and realize that opting out was, was a wrong decision, this is going to be way more painful than realizing that the status quo was wrong. Okay? And this is why uh, so many people are stuck in the status quo. One way, one way to deal with this is to um, deliver the fact to people, and, and, and there are um, interesting priming technique that can make it, but delivering to people the fact that whatever you decide or not decide, it's a decision. If you decide to stick with your status quo, you decided to do it. There's nothing. There's no, there's no difference between sticking to the status quo and opting out of it. Both are decisions. And both are prone to put you in a regret situation in the future. It requires some priming, but, but, um, but it, it's, I think it's important to do. We talk a lot about herd behavior in financial markets, cascading and herd behavior. Much of herd behavior is also coming from regret. Remember company, um, misery likes company? Okay, suppose there are two, two options for me, option, financial option A and financial option B. Let it be stock or bonds. Let it be stock A or stock B. If I know that everybody goes to option A, if I go to option B alone and it turns out to be a mistake, I'll feel much more, it will be, it's going to be much more painful than when I heard with the rest of the people. When we all make the same mistake, I can rationalize this mistake. I can, for some reason, uh, regret would be less painful than the other way around. And because I'm, I have a fear of regret, I would, I would always prefer to go with the hurt. Because the hurt protects me Again, potential, against potential regret in the future. Okay? There's, a, there's a nice effect that has been written about, the, on which people write about um, uh, re recently, we call the ostrich effect. What is the ostrich effect? People seek information uh, when they expect news to be good and avoid it when they expect bad news. Okay? One way it was discovered is, is by looking at data about how often people open their statement envelope that they receive from their financial institute 
in different time, depending on how the market is. Well, it turns out that when the market is good, they open it very quickly. When the market is bad, they just put it into the garbage bin, sealed, right? And never address it. Hmm? Um, people have a difficulty, your, your customers, those of you who, who work in a financial institute, your customer have, um, find it always very painful to look at their statement, okay? But much more when uh, they expect bad news from their statement. They, they, they really, I mean, we looked at statistics recently in Israel and, and it's about more, more than 95% of customers that don't look at their statements. Okay, I doubt, and this is, this is on average, not only in bad times, on average, as you across, across all times. And um, I hope the numbers here are better. Maybe, maybe Swiss people are more educated, uh, financially educated, but um, I doubt that the numbers are much greater here. Home bias is also, I mentioned, you, um, um, we process regret in a very peculiar way. Um, the, the, the other bias in the way we, we um, process regret is that we tend to experience more regret when we take non-conventional decisions. Again, if we do something which is unexpected, and we manage to deal better with regret if the decision we took is the one everybody expected from us. This creates um, home bias. Home bias is when um, um, uh, portfolio managers tend to invest uh, exceedingly more frequently um, with local stocks than with international stocks. And um, and we tend, tend to say, okay, they don't know the market uh, uh, outside the country, they know the market in their country better, but today with, the, uh, with, with technology and, and, and the internet, it's so easy to, to get equal food between here and there, so that, that it just doesn't explain it. And, and what, what explains it better is that, um, is that doing, investing in, in foreign stocks is something which is is, is perceived to be non-conventional. If you made the wrong decision there, you are likely to experience more, um, more regret there. Okay, holding a tight, holding tight to a losing asset. This is this is something that has to do. This is really like the sunk cost paradox. We know that people are very averse to selling a stock uh, uh, that is traded below. Uh, the buying price, and they're willing to keep it, in, sometimes in spite of prediction, in spite of uh, um, noticing that it's, 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 it's not very likely to appreciate anymore. Okay? And the reason they're doing it is because um, as long as you hold this asset, you haven't made a decision, you haven't made a wrong decision either. Okay? If you sell it at loss, you are admitting to everybody, but more importantly to yourself, that you made initially a wrong decision. Holding it potentially uh, allows you to avoid this feeling of regret. Okay, and it just also defers. Even if you are uh, pretty sure that it's unlikely to uh, appreciate much in, in the near future, you defer the regret to the future. We know that we always like we, uh, in the same way that we like good things to happen to us as soon as possible, we like bad things to happen to us as far into the future as possible, okay? So if we expect regret by not selling this asset, we just telling ourselves, let's, let's defer this bad feeling to whatever, you know, whatever time that might arise. This is, by the way, Something that um, financial advisors could help customers. 
Okay? Uh, there's a nice paper published just recently, just a, a couple of weeks ago in, in um, the Journal of Finance. It's, it's an experimental paper <coughs> that shows, that deals with this, with this problem of holding tied to a, to a losing asset. And it shows that uh, while people find it very difficult for them to decide about selling such an asset, they are actually seeking their advisor to do it for them. And by, by you know, loading the advisor with, with his task, you can avoid regret, to a certain, at least to a certain extent, because you, you can argue to yourself, it's, it's not my decision, I, it's, it's, it's this crazy portfolio manager that did it. Okay? It's interesting, I mean, the interaction between financial advisors and customers is, is really a fascinating uh, issue to study. I've been, I've been consulting and, and giving talks uh, in many financial institutions, and one of the, <coughs> one, one of the uh, most frequent compliant that I hear from financial consultants about their customers is that they find it very hard to elicit the preferences of the customers about what they want to do with the money or the risk postulate, the risk preferences, right? Whether they want to invest for long horizon or for short horizon, whether they want to go into a risky um, uh, territory or a more um, conservative territory. Now we all, all banks have these uh, um, forms that they ask uh, the clients to fill out. Uh, by the way, these forms, uh, I've seen these forms and I'm consulting about redesigning them. In many banks, these forms have to be reviewed. They are old and by, by now we gain so much more in um, knowledge about how people uh, react with, with risk and how to elicit correctly the preferences about risk um, that um, really these forms have to be, um, first of all, they have to be done by, uh, by professionals and they have to be constantly updated. I've, I've recently saw uh, the UBS forms and they are really uh, unqualified uh, to get anything from their customers <laughs> about Risk preferences. Never mind. But, but they are complaining that the customers, in spite of these forms, are, 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 are very stubborn about not telling their advisors what they want to do with the money. They said, I'm, you are the expert. You decide. What do you want from me? Now, this is extremely strange because now, today, if a patient has some disease and he goes to a physician, most physicians would not, would not tell you exactly what, what you should be taking for treatment, whether you should take medication or operation, whatever. They will actually give you a menu and tell you the pros and cons of, if, of, of each of these options and let you decide about what, what eventually to do. And with most of us as patients, this is okay. We're used to it by now. 20 or 40 years ago, this would be unheard of, and, and the doctor would say, yeah, you have to do this operation, and that's all. But not today. Today, we accept that we as patients, and, and, and the doctor accept that we as patients uh, should make the decisions ourselves. And these are decisions about life and death that we feel pretty okay making for ourselves, but then those, those investors cannot make similar decision about the money. So what is more important, money or life? But it's not this. It's not, it's not the issue of importance. The difference, the main difference between these two types of decision is going back to regret. Because why, one reason, and this is why, and again, why financial advisors are so, um, are so important, this plays out in this... Um, in this uh, recent paper in Journal of Finance about holding tight to losing asset, is um, 
the investors need the consultant in order to have him as, or her as a media or as a tool to make decisions without experiencing regret. The difference between medical decision and a financial decision is that with financial decision, you, always, you will always learn the consequences of whatever decision that has been taken. Wait one year, and you will know whether your decision was correct or not. But just looking at the newspaper and see how your, or at your statement and see how your financial assets are doing. With medical decisions, it's not the same, because you will never know the counterfactuals. If you are taking a medication, you wouldn't know how bad you were or how well you would have done if instead you took the operation. And this is, this is why um, it's easier for us to make our own decision when it gets to medical decision than when it gets to uh, financial decision. We are terrified by the potential regret that it must, might cause us. And if there is somebody that can make the decision for us, or at least let us believe that he makes the decision for us, by eliciting as good as possible what, what is good for us, what, what, eliciting our preferences, um, uh, then, then, then we, we, it makes things much easier for us. And this is one of the important functions of, um, um, uh, of financial consultants. What I'm always saying, that, you, you know, there are some, some people um, for which how the financial portfolio is doing from one year to another um, is very crucial to their standard of living. Um, but, but, but not for most of investors, and definitely not for big investors. Whether it went up by 10% or went down by 15%, this, is, this, this would be inconsequential in terms of their standard of living. It will be extremely consequential in terms of the mental impact that it will have on them. Okay? And therefore, it's so important not only to, to when advising these people, not only to ask the question about, you know, um, what, how likely it is that he'll make, you know, what, what, what's right in terms of the prospects of the portfolio to make money or to avoid loss, but also how good this portfolio in the se in sense of how this person will feel through the time of his investment, how well he or she will sleep at night, how, how difficult it's going to be for him when he, when, when he learns that he lost part of the asset. Okay? And this is something that, uh, um, unfortunately, um, not many people in your territory are, are, are paying attention to. I'm about to, to end. I'm just let you know that um, today, with technology, we are capable of um, locating in the brain where the trigger, where the emotional triggers of regret appear. And we can study uh, their fascinating um, research studies um, using fMRI that actually can simulate um, uh, the appearance of regret due to um, an occurrence of a financial uh, event, for instance, in laboratory. So we, we, simulate, uh, we simulate a situation in which people lose or gain money, and we can, at the time when they make the decisions and realize the consequences of their decision, we can brain scan uh, 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 and, and, and see uh, the extent to which they, they feel regret. Regret is processed in, in, a, in a part of the brain which is called striatum, and this is, this is also um, a part of the brain that, um, that generates a very important horm hormone called dopamine, which is called the reward hormone. Uh, that uh, make us feel happy when we, um, when we 
uh, gain, when we have gains, when we win, um, when, our, uh, when we get a, a positive financial news, but, but make us also, or lack of it, make us feel bad when we get bad news. Okay? Let me just finish by um, saying a couple of words about how to overcome emotional barriers. As I said, um, because much of these barriers are emotional rather than conventional, we, we need to seek uh, new remedies. And one of these remedies is, is awareness, okay? Um, awareness to the fact, you know, being aware to the fact that, th that um, you know, these, these emotions um, are there uh, because of evolutionary reasons, but they often act against our interests, just like pain is, right? Pain, feeling pain, is one of the most important mechanisms for survival. Imagine how um, uh, vulnerable we would have been if we couldn't uh, detect um, things that are going wrong in our body, okay? Pain is the most important alarm system that uh, evolution created in us, but very often it is activated when it shouldn't be, right? If we break our hand, it's painful, and, and there's a, this alarm system is, is shouting, uh, but we know very well that we have this problem, and it still doesn't help us to know it. We still experience this pain. Okay, this is, this is pretty much the same with, with negative emotions. They are there because of evolutionary reason, because of the alarm, uh, the emotional alarm system that they trigger. But very often, uh, they do things beyond, the, beyond what they were meant for, um, and, and then we have to control them. And, and being aware of, of where they're coming very often makes it easy to control them. This is one thing. The other, the other way of dealing with it is, is use agency, okay? Um, which is getting assistance from people who don't have, who are not uh, prone to, to experience these negative emotions, like, um, you know, consulting with a friend about decision. This friend uh, friends are, are immune to those emotions that might affect us. And they might tell us, you know, uh, you might feel with this decision, but it, it really seems to be, to be the right decision to me, okay? Uh, agency could help a lot in us overcoming these barriers. And consultants, uh, serving as a consultant and professional consultants is, is one of the ways you create agency to help you with uh, this type of decision making. I think I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll stop here, but I'm, uh, I'll be glad to address your questions if you have some. Thank you.